Hello, everyone. It's a not so beautiful day in the neighborhood around Shea Cricket, but it's a perfect day for tea. I'm so excited to be bringing you a conversation with the lovely, the luscious, the ever on point Ennis Carter, whom I have known for over a decade now. We first met um, through Alternate Roots. Um, when um, I was on staff there and Ennis came on board to help us with all of our communications from rebuilding our website to uh, talking about our brand. Uh, Ennis is the founding director of Social Impact Studios uh, based in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Um, and she got her start as a community organizer in New Jersey. I'm so excited to talk about that part of her life uh, because I'm telling y'all, Ennis is the OG um, she she started campaigns that are still with us today, like I think Meat Free Mondays, um, all kinds of cool stuff. And now she works with nonprofits and artists all over the country, helping them tell their um, their brand stories. So Ennis, are you are you there? Ennis, knock knock knock. Ennis, hello. There she is. Hello. I'm so glad you're here. Are you going to be having some tea today? I am having tea today. Oh, why don't you tell everybody about what tea you're having and I'm going to get my hot water and start brewing mine. I'm having a lemon lavender tea in mm -hmm. honor of Shannon uh, oh. because she is a grounding and calming force in the world. Oh. <laughs> you made my day. Well, I'm going to have seven flowers tea, which is an honor because it was given to me by Bailey Barish, whom you may remember from Alternate Roots. Mm -hmm. Bailey is one of the biggest tea aficionados I know. She has this very robust tea collection. Um, and I have uh, spent uh, many a week at Bailey's house as she's traveled the planet. Um, and her tea collection is also from her travels from the planet. Um, and it's so robust that uh, her tea drawer fell on me one time. <laughs> <laughs> That's one of the benefits of being an OG uh, yes. is that you get to accumulate a lot of tea. <laughs> yes, indeed. Um, so uh, this is her most recent tea gift to me. And so I'm really looking forward to trying it. Mm, thank you so much for your kind words. I lemon lavender, did you say? Yes, lemon lavender. Enough, <laughs> enough little punch of a lemon but a lavender to calm you down nice where did that come from um it's just a tea i've had and i really like mm, nothing, nice nothing special i think it's you know something i bought at the supermarket somewhere but it was the right the right blend and seemed perfect for today lovely cool 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 well thank you for being here with me today i know you're often on the zoomy zooms with people all over the place um as uh, Social Impact Studios is working with people and helping to support their, their brand stories. You're a storyteller in a, a different kind of way than I am, but uh, very important kinds of stories. Um, so I would love to kind of go back in time and, and, and find out about your origin story as any good superheroine would do. Um, <laughs> I... I love, um, I want to start with your name. Do you mind to tell us like a, a fun thing about your name? Because we uh, we had a fun connection when I went to Ireland about the fact that you're Ennis and I'm Shannon. And, yes. and Ireland, in Ireland, Ennis and Shannon are very close to each other. They are. They are. They may even be in the same county, County Clare. Mm -hmm. I don't know about that. Um, but yeah, Ennis is actually, I'm going to divulge right here. So the people who are tuning in and seeing this, they will learn something about me that many people do not know that Ennis is actually my maiden name, um, that I grew up with that as my last name. And when I started my business and my social enterprise and also got married to my best friend who I'd been together with for 10 years already, um, I decided that I wanted a change but I did not want to get rid of that part of me. And so I took Ennis as my first name and Carter as my last name at that time. And Ennis actually means in Irish means island. Um, and so it's a very interesting, 
I think of it often because my, uh, my original first name is Deborah, which means the bee. And that's a very communal um, kind of character that's buzzing around and doing different things. And I'm thinking about your flower tea, um, kind of going from person to person, which I still do. And Deborah is also from the Bible. She was one of the first uh, judges and generals, uh, a woman general uh, in the Bible, who used to hear, sit under a palm tree, a date palm tree to hear people's come to her and get judgments and different advice. Um, so I still feel very connected to that part of me, but um, I really, you know, felt like I was grounding into my own little island in a good way um, to develop myself as a, and that middle period of my life um, as I get close to 60 uh, in a couple of years um, that Ennis felt like the right fit. And so I've used that ever since. You know, I spent a lot of time in my young life playing around with my name uh, in all kinds of ways, whether I was playing around with how Shannon was spelled or had a nickname Cricket for a long time. That's why my personal email address is Red Cricket and I live in a house called Shea Cricket. Um, there's still to this day a few people that call me Cricket. Um, and even uh, like when I was a little girl, sometimes when I would be like plopped at a daycare, I would pull online and tell people I had a different name. <laughs> um but I'm curious what it's like to go about the process, like the, the the life project of getting people to call you by a different name for a long time. It must have felt like a, a little bit like a head spin for a while. It was, but I think Ennis, you know, Deborah is different than Debbie and I am a very small person um, and being a little Debbie is kind of not really my vibe, right? <laughs> It wasn't that weird to people. Like that. It's like, you know, people would already call me Ennis, you know, in your last name, how you get called your last name and that kind of, um, you know, familiar way. Mm -hmm. So then when I changed it and I asked people to just start using Ennis and I was also venturing out, I started Social Impact Studios and it was a, not a gendered name. Uh, mm -hmm. That was intentional uh, because I really wasn't feeling like anybody needed to really know that. Um, and it just kind of stuck and I just kept doing it. And I still respond to Deborah or Debbie or any of those little things. And I did the same thing. I used to spell it with an I and then, you know, it was a Deb and there's all sorts of different ways to, you know, use that name. Mm -hmm. But I think because I... When I feel really sure about something, I'm pretty, I like to communicate it. And I like to make sure that I'm explaining why and what's going on with me. Um, and I hope that that helped people kind of get what was going on. Yeah, I love that. Like, I, I think that is a very strong choice. I remember when you first told me about this, when we were working together all the time, that the the idea of, of having an, a non-gendered name and how that would... Um, you know, could potentially change your applications on things and um, people's assumptions about you. And it, and it does, like, you are a force of nature. Like, I, I I hope people can already see that about, you know, our conversation. Like, if, if somebody didn't meet you in the real world, but even like, it, like, you wouldn't really know that you're kind of like, on the shorter side of stature. <laughs> you know, like, That's a nice way of saying it. I'm not even 4'11". So I am definitely on the shorter <laughs> side. <laughs> Energy like precedes you in all kinds of ways. But I, I think that, um, you know, being like taking your power back through your name is such a, a wonderful way. And then there's like deep cultural roots around people getting to choose their own name. So yeah. Yeah. There, there's Thanks only one that. that ever called me by my last name and that was Joe Carson. And like some of my favorite memories of her would be like, she would say, Turner, I'm gonna need you to tell me a better story. You know? <laughs> so great. What were you about to say? I interrupted you. No, I was just going to say that this was also back in 1996 when I started um, Social Impact Studios. And so it was more of a, it just felt right. It was more of an intuition, which is definitely how I have always 
kind of done my life and run my things is through intuition, not even knowing it until probably recently. And it wasn't intentionally like, okay, I have to have a non-gender name and I have to have this and I have to have that. It And it wasn't necessarily something that people were talking about in 1996 uh, in popular culture in mainstream culture. So it was, it was a little bit of a, you know, a lift, but it felt so right that it didn't really just kind of happen. Oh my gosh. I have to tell you this tea that Bailey has given me is got such a kick to it. It's like <laughs> maybe like a licorice or a, Ooh, I love licorice. It's like orange blossom Mexican hand plant like it's so forward and it's zippiness not surprised at all and also Bailey one of our like she's one of the shorties like us you know <laughs> yep so um we were talking about your more past we'll come to the future and all of that in a minute but was I right you founded Ma meat free monday campaign, right? Well, it, yeah, Meatless Monday. Um, we were part of an effort to start that with the a foundation up in New York and a former madman named Sid Lerner, who's no, he's an ancestor now. Um, but he was part of the whole Madison Avenue advertising universe. And in the late nineties, early two thousands, um, he wanted to start an initiative, a health-based initiative to help people cut saturated fat out of their diet. And he grew up during the war when there was a meatless Monday um, to save on rations and, you know, availability of meat. And he said, oh, let's, let's turn this into something that people could remember and associate with. Um, so then we helped develop the whole look and feel and the identity of it and the storytelling and also the local, we piloted local initiatives as an organizer. That's something I also think is super important. It's not just about having a cool logo and a cool name, which is always helpful, but um, just getting on the ground. And honestly, when you're doing a campaign to try to get people to stop doing something, you want to give them something else. So we would um, have chili cook-offs with no meat in them, um, you know, things that people love no matter what, and they don't even care if there's meat in it um, to make it more fun and engaging. But yeah, we were, we were the part of the people who made that a thing. And now it's a global phenomenon. Wow. Yeah, it is. It is. Um, and so posters for the people also a, a part of your early uh, professional life in that way. Tell us about that. Sure. That's definitely one of my labors of love. So Posters to the People is a project that actually didn't even start as a project. It started because I am a, a visual artist who also loves public narrative and how we tell the story of what's happening in our larger social structures through visuals, through language, and I adore the history of social art. So mural making and propaganda from all sorts of different perspectives, posters ultimately are a way to transmit information. And that style of the 1930s and 1940s, I, um, when I was in high school, I was an exchange student in Mexico City. And so I was exposed to all of the Diego Rivera murals and all of the Mexican artists that really influenced the social art in the United States. Um, and so I've always been in love with that style. And I found out about the posters that were made during the WPA, which was during the New Deal, right after the Big Depression in the 1920s um, into the 30s. And when Roosevelt ran for office, uh, Franklin Roosevelt ran for office, he ran on a platform to help get people back to work because there was such a, the depression knocked out about a third of the country was out of work. Uh, people who were able to work of all sorts of backgrounds, um, all sorts of backgrounds. So I found out that there was actually a division of workers that were commercial artists 
graph, what would be called graphic designers now, um, that were hired to make posters to promote theater productions and educational programs and work programs because there was no, there's no internet, <laughs> there was no TV. There was just radio and community, you know, kiosks. So posters were a big part of that um, experience. And I fell in love with them. And then I found out that they were not considered art. So they were never documented. And these are, these are a lens into the history of the WPA, into a lot of different people from different backgrounds who actually were hired um, there's a whole Harlem division of black graphic designers and printers that made these posters that were, that were handmade and, um, elevate and actually defined what screen printing is in the art world right now. Um, so Shepard Ferry and Karita Kent, um, really owe a lot to the artists that were developing the screen printing technology, um, back in the thirties. And so I found out that they weren't being documented and nobody was really interested in documenting them. Uh, so I and a bunch of people that worked at Social Impact started researching, digging through collections, finding them in people's basements and finding them in large institutions. And so we created this project called Posters for the People. And it is an archive, it's a digital archive of posters that we have been able to find um, the the Library of Congress had 900 posters, and that was considered the definitive record. Um, but there were 35,000 poster designs that we know were made. Um, so 900 didn't seem like enough. And to date, we have identified more than 2,600. Um, so we've more than doubled, almost tripled the amount that was known to exist and representing um, the work at the time, the people at the time, and the culture, uh, what was happening for folks. Mm. So how is that digital archive used these days? So people, first of all, people, uh, a lot of people purchase reproductions. We, we have everything that's on there, um, with the exception of things that may be depicting old fashioned and racist concepts. Like we document everything, but we do not make that available to for reproduction. There's not much of that, honestly. It was very much about, you know, pulling back up people that had been really pushed down by the depression and lack of, and a lot of immigrant communities, a lot of bilingual um, stuff. So people go to it to research. Um, you can keyword search so you can find information about like what you're interested in. Um, and a lot of people buy reproductions. And then people also share if they find a poster out there, they can send us an alert um, with an image of it. And we'll be we add that to the um, public record, you know, because we're the people that care about keeping it. So great. I, I remember when I was studying under Bob Leonard at Virginia Tech, we spent a lot of time studying that, you know, the WPA and, uh, you know, obviously, especially because of the Federal Theater Project. And I remember that, you know, when we were entering into the pandemic and um, then trying to build our way out of it, I kept hoping that there would be more investment in artists as a way to help ourselves dream our way back out of this dark time. Yeah. Yeah. Because artists are the ones who can do, who can imagine and then materialize anything. Yeah. 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 So let's, let's come forward in time a little bit and talk about what social impact studios is and, and has been and, and what you're doing. And yeah. Yeah. Well, um, thanks for identifying that I was an organizer because I I studied, I went to New York University back in the 80s and I studied liberal arts like most people that grew up in, a, I grew up in Virginia in the suburbs, kind of wanting to do, knowing there's a bigger world out there, wanting to do more, went and studied philosophy and religion, you know, got that classic liberal arts <laughs> background. And then it was like, okay, now what, what are you going to do with that? And I knew I wanted to do something good, but I didn't know what that meant. And I got a job as an environmental organizer in New Jersey and working on good government issues like 
voter registration and um, hunger and homelessness, um, things that were really affecting public interest work. And I knocked on a lot of doors. I talked to a lot of people, ran campaigns, and I kept I kept finding that the story is really at the core of of engagement. And it's not just about making it clear, but it's about people finding themselves in it. And that communication isn't just about, especially as an organizer, as an environmental organizer, it's not just about telling people what's wrong. And especially now we're, you know, the climate change issue and especially young people. I have a daughter who's almost 20. <laughs> um, uh, <laughs> Yep. Um, that they are feeling completely like it's over. And they're, of course, it is devastatingly difficult what's happening, but it's not enough to just talk about what is wrong. Um, that there's a level, there's there's only so much that people can handle um before they start kind of not, you know, it, it can be counterproductive to only be talking about all of the details of the science and what's wrong. And we need to be present with that, but that's not enough. And so knocking on doors and talking to people and finding what people really, you know, what the, what the common qualities were of the story that people related to um, really made me understand that I was more of that. My organizing was going to be, aided by really creative communication. That's always what I've been interested in. And if you'd asked me when I was seven, what I was going to be, I would have told you a statistician. I have no idea why. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but then if you had asked me in high school, I would have said some kind of advertising or some sort of, you know, like thing. And I think it's because I'm really drawn to the idea of, of the public narrative and what, what is our common understanding as much as possible of a story of a common narrative and culture, right? Uh, influenced by culture. So when we started Social Impact Studios back in 96, there was no internet. I need to say that. And right. there was no internet. <laughs> we, we barely had fax machines that were, you know, sending things around. So back then, it was really, you know, making flyers and newsletters and postcards and things that would help people understand things through material. And so design, very important. And Microsoft Publisher or something? <laughs> <laughs> we actually used, um, we used something that came before. It was an Adobe product. It was called like PageMaker, I think. Yes. Um, yes. <laughs> yes. We were professionals. We used okay. like Adobe products. <laughs> okay. um, and I'm not trained in graphic design, but I, I love visual storytelling. And so I just did it and I, and I did it in service to the organizing. So I learned that. Uh, and now 27, 28 years later, Really, what I see that we've always been, and what we do most most of all, is that we are a we're we're a creative hub, and so it we bring together people around creative ways of getting some information out, and we're engaging people to act on important issues. And the best way to engage them is through a cultural lens, because people make decisions and act based on culture. Um, there's a very famous quote from Peter Drucker, where he says, culture eats strategy for breakfast. And we can spend all the time we want making all these strategies and tactics. And, and it's important to do that, but it can be completely shifted by one bit of cultural, you know, shift, uh, change or storytelling. People have an idea about how something is and, and make a story around that. That can be 10 times as powerful as any tactic um, or strategy that you can make in communications. So we do all sorts of things now because there's the internet and because there's direct um, grassroots engagement. And we help people really figure out what they want, what they're, you know, how to talk about what they're doing. Um, really making sure that 
people have all the tools, anybody who's doing good work in the world, that they don't have to reinvent the wheels, but more importantly, that they're not doubting their story and what they're doing just because it may not seem like it fits in with the, you know, social media or don't know how to do that or, um, you know, feeling like, like it's not good enough um, to engage people. Um, And we do that in all sorts of different ways. So can you give us an example of like one client that you're working with and how you're coaching them through the work? Yeah. So we have, we actually have three ways that people work with us. One is through our public image works method. So I created a method that was based off of what I did just to really help my own team understand easier ways to do what we do. And then we made tools and a curriculum and a whole program around that. So now we offer that up for people to be able to go through workshops and tech and uh, skill building and tools and everything from figuring out your identity, which is the word we use instead of brand, um, to figuring out the best practice for your publicity. Like how do you actually roll something out and how often do you do that? And how do you use all these technical tools to do that? So that's the first way that people work with us. And we always have kind of a rolling cohort of people that are going through that program. And then the second way that people work with us is as client, creative clients, where we utilize that method to help them most often look at a year of, you know, communication and public image management. So we work with, we do that with the Intercultural Leadership Institute, um, which is a cohort fellowship program. A lot of folks that we know from Roots are part of that. Um, And we basically help create a roadmap and a strategy, and then we create um, content around the blog or the emails, and then we help them, you know, move through it. And sometimes they need us to be laying the groundwork and then they pick it up and run with it. But sometimes we are the people that are really deeply embedded with them, almost in a partnership. And and Ely is like that. Um, But we're doing that with Ely. We're doing that with the South Asian Theater Festival, um, with the Epic Actors Workshop, which is in New Jersey, and they host an, a South Asian theater festival. And it's all volunteer run, but it's this amazingly professional level theater like festival. Um, so we help with most, I would say the way that we help people, I hope the way that we help people is to take, to remove barriers more than adding more to their plate. So Communication is really just that. It's just about constantly sharing what you're excited about (laughs) and doing that in a way that doesn't overload you and make it a whole other job. It's not supposed to be that. It's supposed to be easy and joyful and activating your inspired ideas and getting the word out is inherently um, mission work, in my opinion. It's like, it's really the mission work because it's about connecting to others. So, and then the third way that we work with people is in direct collaboration. So we are partners on a couple of different projects. So last year we developed a game app for, um, in collaboration with the discovery orchestra, which is a teaching orchestra that teaches people how to listen differently through the lens of classical music, learning the parts and the pieces of classical music. Um, and so we figured out a way to trick out technology in a way that was affordable and developed a Duolingo style app called AHA Classical. And you can go in and you can take quests and you can go do listening guides and you can get, you can earn notes and you can earn scores and all of that. Um, And it's in this, it's in the app stores. We figured out how to do it. Um, at a fraction of the cost um, that most apps would take to make because we put in our sweat equity and our love of this project and they put in some money to help us like make sure we could keep the lights on. Wow. You should be selling that to schools. That's awesome. Yeah. 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 Wow. yeah but it helped us develop every time we do something, we learn how to, how to leverage whatever it is in the benefit of social impact. So now we know how to do this. We can do this for more people. Hey, can we go back 
back to the part where you you dropped in about talking about identity instead of brand. I would love to learn about your philosophy around that. That's really interesting. Yeah. So it's not a problem to use the word brand or marketing, but I feel that the work that we're doing is the word brand literally means to burn onto. And it is inherently in that connected to ownership It's connected to proprietary ownership. And um, for me, I think that there's a lot of problematic parts to that um, ideas and, you know, um, activating work, especially creative work in the world is not about ownership. It is, it is, it needs to be protected. It can't be just, you know, everybody can't just access everybody else's appropriate, everybody else's culture. But I do think that um, what I think is that the folks that we work with, it's not really a brand, but it's coming from within. It's an identity that's coming from inside out. And that that is, is deeper than a mark that can just be a mark right? Um, and so we mean the same thing when we say identity. We mean, you know, how how it's represented in a logo or a slogan or um, a website. All of that is a critical part of it, but it's a combination of internal understanding first. And often when people are thinking of brands, they think about what other people want, and that is important, but it has to be in relation to your own values and your own um, understanding of what you believe you're doing, why you're doing it, what the vision is of it. Um, so that's one reason that we use the word identity instead of brand. Um, and that all of the things that are associated with that are actually your identity resources. So having your visuals and your messaging and your website, all of that, those are resources for you to like cultivate, not just make sure you've got in a box. Mm -hmm. uh, and then the companion to that is the word marketing, which honestly, if we lived in a culture where the open market was the way that we were all doing things. So one of my favorite um, TV shows is the street food um, show on Netflix. I don't know if you've watched it, but there's people all over the world that are, you know, they make something beautiful and delicious and then they're selling it on the street. And most often it's in a market situation or they're literally carrying it around in a cooler, like yelling on the beach. Like I have these amazing empanadas, come get them. If that was how we did the market, I would use the word marketing. Um, but I think in our culture and specifically for folks like us, marketing has a real icky feeling to it because it feels like it's a manipulated medium. And I think that it's it's not only exclusively connected to capitalism, but that's how it's really been developed. And um, you know, I've I've worked with a lot of nonprofit organizations that have been told by funders and other people that might be supporting them that they needed to get more professional or they needed to get their marketing tighter. And I think it's really about it's really more about publicity and the word public. Like it's about sharing your story. It's about shouting it from the rooftops, not about like, are we selling something? Am I selling you something? Um, and so I think that's why we use, and words are important, right? Mm -hmm. Wow. Well, I'm sold. <laughs> um, so, you know, the reason why I'm having these conversations with people near and far is because I am working on my first full length Shannon Tells a Story project. And um, yeah, a, a teapot, uh, I'm a little teapot uh, coming soon to a theater or a house near you. <laughs> um, and I've selected four words as sort of the pillars of the project, possibility, power, passion, and purpose. Um, I'm wondering if you want to tell us a story today that do you have any like resonance or like a story that these words pop off for you? Wow. So many, because I use those words all the time. Possibility, power. What was the Passion. other one? Passion. Passion. Purpose. So... I love these words and I am going to 
ping off of the word power um, because I think so many people bristle at the word power and get uncomfortable around the idea of power. And I want to tell a story about... Um, <laughs> I want to tell a story about what I think is a good example of power. And I think of it in terms of like agent self-agency, that if everybody was doing their own power or their superpower at its core and really tapping into what felt natural, um, that there would be a shoulder to shoulder shared power. And that's my vision of what I think is the possibility, the other word that you have there. Um of what we actually can be doing. And um, yeah. So what came to me was a story about when I was five, my father was serving in Vietnam and my mother and I lived in Florida and because my grandparents lived there and she was working and also going to school and I would sometimes stay with my grandparents, but they would also, you know, pick me up at school. My granddaddy would pick me up at school. And it's so funny that this popped into my head when you asked about power, because I could talk about power in a lot of different strategic like ways. But the thing that really came to me was that one day we were at school and I went to Humpty Dumpty Kitty College Awesome. <laughs> which I graduated from. I didn't graduate from all the institutions that I ever went to in my life, but that one I did <laughs> nice. with a little mortar board and everything. Uh -huh. um, and, you know, I just did not want to take a nap that day. <laughs> I did not want to take a nap. And I also didn't like what whatever was being served like for lunch. I, I just didn't, it just did not work for me. Um, and I remember this very vividly, just saying like, oh, I got to call my granddaddy and he'll pick me up and my day will be done. I don't need to be here anymore because we're just going to eat this crappy lunch and then we're going to take a nap. And I, even though I was, even though I'm small and I was small then, like I would not have been able to reach the telephone. And somehow I pulled a chair over, I got up to the telephone and I called my granddaddy to come pick me up. And he did. <laughs> I'm done here. Take me home. <laughs> it's so awesome. that, yeah, that just came up to me because first of all, I, I do think that I don't ever, ever, ever underestimate the support that I had in my family to feel comfortable and confident that somebody had my back. Right. And I know that not everybody has that. And I was very, very fortunate to have uh, that surrounding me. Um, but I also, I remember kind of getting in trouble for that. Like, I remember that they're like, wait, how did you do that? Like, what are you, what are you talking about? And a few things that came to me were what I had in my toolkit to be able to be empowered. So I had I had a community, I had a support of just one person. It can just be one person. Um, you know, it can just be one thing, one place, one institution. And it doesn't have to be everybody in the world. Um, I had some knowledge of a phone number. I knew how to communicate. I knew at five, like how to call my people. Mm -hmm. And I think that that is really key to power, which is like, do we know how to connect? Can we put the bat signal up? Can we reach out? Can we, you know, I knew how, and it was just like deeply embedded. And then I also had assistive technology. I had a chair I had, but I had to go get it myself. And that to me is also agency. Um, and how my wish for everybody is that they, that they have some kind of sense that they can go get a chair on their own. They don't need permission to get a chair to be able to activate this communication channel um, that, that everybody, that's my wish for everybody is that everybody can do that. And there may be people that don't like it, but who cares? Like it, ultimately um, 
it worked out. He came and got me. <laughs> we went and got ice cream or something. Um, but it does take power takes initiative and um, practice. So I don't know if that's what you were looking for. Oh, that is so <laughs> great. I love it. I love it. I This is this is like ready for your TED talk, <laughs> which I really hope you'll do. And I'll be happy to help you formulate uh, <laughs> if you need any coaching. Um, well, I am... Um, this is making me think about a story of, uh, in the same time frame, um, very different, uh, that like the opposite lesson. <laughs> um, as you may remember, I'm legally blind in one eye from a congenital cataract. And, um, I would tell my parents when I was a little, little, little girl that I was blind in one eye and they, they, She's just so dramatic. Such a, such a, <laughs> yeah. yeah. And then so finally, when I went to kindergarten and they did standard screening on all, all of us, they sent me home with note and they would be like, oh, she really is. <laughs> so then started like the endless uh, journey of, because it was lazy, the, you know, it was lazy. And so it was like making the good eye do all the work. So they, First, they started with just putting tape over the good eye glasses. So I would like pull the, you know, my glasses down like this and like I was a little old lady and look over the top. Um, and then they tried putting drops in my good eye and I was allergic to them. Like I had this night where I just like cried and screamed and banged my head on the, I ended up in the emergency room. Uh, so then they tried doing patches and Every day I would go to kindergarten. Farmer in the Dell was the name of my kindergarten because I was in Tennessee. The farmer in the Dell, the farmer in the Dell. Hi ho, the dairy oh, the farmer in the Dell. Yes. Um, I went to Farmer in the Dell every day with a patch on my eye. And every day I would come home with no patch on my eye. And uh for a minute, they got hit to the tip that I was throwing it away in the wastebasket in the bathroom. So the teacher started like following me into the bathroom to make sure that patch stayed on. And then the patch just wasn't coming home with me. And it was a total mystery. Like I became a genius at ditching the patch. At some point in the day, nobody could figure it out. At the end of the school year, brought home all of my stuff, including my nap pillow, which had a little hole in it. And so I was taking off my patch and stuffing the, the patch in the little pillow. And my mom washed, washed the pillow and like 27 patches came out. And I was in so much trouble for that because, you know, they were really trying. And, you know, in retrospect, like, I really wish that someone had done a better job of, like, figuring out how to keep the patch on my eye because I would have been in a better state, you know. But it felt like they were tying one hand behind my back, you know. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but in terms of the really lovely storytelling bow that you put on on your story, I think about that now in terms of the bad lesson of power that I was learning, which is I was accessing power in a back channel, sneaky, couldn't, couldn't say what I needed, wanted. And so I, I just went around and got it any way that I could. Mm -hmm. And I think that that is oftentimes, unfortunately, some white women uh, think they don't have power. And so they don't talk directly to the person about the thing that they need. They just yeah. go around the person and get it done some other way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 I think that's, I think that's so, I mean, part of it is people doubting their own ability to communicate right what and fear about communication and then identifying only certain people as having power in our 
in our society um, and just wielding that. Yeah, that's really interesting. Okay, so one more uh, little trick to get you to tell a story. I have these dice on my screen here. I'm going to roll them. You tell uh -oh. me when. Tell me when you're rolling them. Are they rolling? Yes, they're rolling. You tell me when to stop. Okay, stop. 87. 87. Tell me about yourself at the age of 87. Oh, I thought you were going to say in 1987, which I could tell you also. Well, you that if you want. <laughs> either way, either tell me a story about yourself in 1987 or yourself at the age of 87. You choose. Goodness. Um, okay. 87, huh? When I'm 87, goodness gracious. Um, so as I told you, I'm coming up on 60 and I, for some reason, I have kind of a 30 year chunks in my understanding of my life because so much shifted when I was 30. And I see my, you know, younger self before 30. I see my other self between 30 and I'm feeling like transformation is happening when I'm for the next, whatever's next, um, which would, I keep equating with like from 60 to 90, right? Uh, in a 30 year chunk. So when I'm 87, I will be at the next coming up on a transition phase. Um, and I will be, um, it's so interesting. I'm thinking of um, what <laughs> my role models who have been 87 and what people were doing and the difference between men and women um, and my generation, my generation X generation being so differently oriented to what we've done in our lives, independent, very independent. So I um, imagine myself as being independent and living somewhere where I am walking around a lot. And I may be in a city, but it may be a little, a littler city than Philly or New York, which I'm used to. And I imagine, I don't know, maybe I'll go back to being Deborah again. And I will flit from place to place and I will hold, you know, I will be an action advisor and I will, um, yeah, I, th I think I'll be still tapping into my fulfilling my life's purpose, which I, I still think is very much about active. What I've been thinking about the last 10 years is like activating inspired, like the inspirations here, we just have to activate it and what do you need? And let's get going. And that could take all sorts of forms. I can't even imagine what that will be like um, in whatever year that is. I'm not going to try to do that math right now. <laughs> But I, I love that that thirty year chunk approach. Um, you know, Julia Ju Louis Dreyfus was doing an amazing podcast where she set out to interview a bunch of women who were older than her. Uh -huh. And I can't remember if it was it was either Jane Fonda or Carol Burnett, but one of them said the three act approach to life, and they had the same mm -hmm. time frame that you're talking about in terms of thirty years. So I, I think you're really onto something with that. Mm -hmm. um, and I can't wait to see what your, your third act looks like. It's very exciting. Very exciting. Yeah. So, um, so. No, do I, you have to answer this question also? What are you doing at 87? <laughs> yeah, I, uh, I also think I'll be walking a lot, you know, that's my jam. Um, and I, I hope to be living independently I really would love to have found a life partner by then. I, I, lo I love what you said about your, your, you married your best friend. Like that's definitely a beautiful, beautiful thing about your life. And um, I don't know, hope to be, you know, telling stories maybe from a rocking chair by that point, but definitely. <laughs> yeah. Hope I finally have like made the show happen. 
<laughs> oh goodness. Don't be silly. <laughs> Um, so I, I forgot to ask you about your band. Is it called the spreadsheets? It has some like really cute <laughs> non charts. <laughs> the flip <laughs> charts. <laughs> yes. The spreadsheets. That's, That's my other band. Um, <laughs> the flip charts. Yeah. So my husband, Phil, is a musician and has been forever and ever and ever before he was even born, I'm sure. And he is a um, songwriter, guitarist, was in some bands that people may or may not have known before. And before the pandemic, I don't even know how it started, but we were just noodling around. And my father always played acoustic guitar for me when I was a kid. Like he would sing me to sleep at night with acoustic guitar. I love it. I've always been in love with it. I've always sort of picked it up and played around with it. And then somehow, a um, couple years before the pandemic, like 2017 or 18, I just started picking it up again and um, learning some alternative uh, techniques that he is developing into a teaching method for a guitar. And because I've been listening to his work for 30 something years, we've been together 38 years, I was I was able to just play those songs and sing those songs. And I think it was a little bit of a surprise for him. He's like, oh, you have been, <laughs> you have been listening um, because so much of our, you know, I'm the out, I'm definitely the extrovert. I'm definitely got my own, you know, path that I'm following and he has his and we're partners for life, but we're shoulder to shoulder on it. Uh, and he's a key part of helping, you know, support the business of Social Impact Studios, but um it's been really important for him to do his thing and me to do mine artistically. And when we came together, it just clicked. Uh, and it was really fun because after 38 years and having a kid that's almost 20, you're kind of like, oh, hi, you. I know you. We've done this before. What are we doing next? And it was a whole new world. And um, so we started a band called The Flip Charts. And we recorded an album that's up on Spotify and we go on little tours. We do house tours and um, we just played at, we were commissioned to write a song to close the Virginia Farm to Table Conference uh, in, in Harrisonburg, Virginia, with all these farmers and soil managers coming together. And we got to write a, um, I would say it's kind of like a schoolhouse rock meets folk music song about protecting the soil called for the soil. And we just have a blast. We go and play, we have fun and we love it. So thanks for asking. Yeah. So I'm curious, this is like a new form of your creativity that you're getting to explore. Um, and in some ways, even though I've been a professional storyteller now for seven years, uh, I've spent a lot of time really coaching other people in their storytelling, which is why endeavoring to do this full length night of storytelling is, is a new thing. Um, do you have any advice for me about what, what I should be thinking about, especially as I go to like, try to do concerts the way that you were doing? Like, what are you learning about through the process? Yeah, I am learning that that's a really good question. I'm learning that, um, that there people see people will always see you through their lens right and um there's that um book by gay hendrix called the big leap which talks about being in four different zones um there's the zone of incompetence where it's like you shouldn't bother doing things like for mine i should never try to fix my own car <laughs> like that would just not be a good use of my time and would <laughs> not work and i should just not do that and then there's zone of competence, which is like, you can do it, but other people do it better. Why are you spending your time? And sometimes we do those things just because it's, you know, it's a way to like, I'm going to print out and fold and stuff all of these envelopes or whatever, um, because I can, and it will feel like a sense of accomplishment. Mm -hmm. And then there's the zone of excellence, which is something that we've developed over time and we have great skill at, and people see us through that lens. So in my case, it's always like, she's a really good communicator. She's really good at like strategic thinking and branding and marketing and, you know, all of these things that I do. Um, but then there's the zone of genius, which is the thing that you would do 
no matter what, no matter who you are, you get into that place, you feel it, you, whether you were paid or not. And for me, I continue to think that my zone of genius is um, helping people remember that it's possible, like to, to be an optimistic, you know, cautiously optimistic person, but that we actually have agency in this world and we can make the world that we want. And if we're willing to work at it and um, bring others along and be willing to share and all of those things. So I would say for you, being aware of what your zone of genius feels like, because people will continue to only see you through your zone of excellence. Um, and that you may have a, a, a feeling, an intuitive feeling about how you want this to go. And you may have been so good at um, facilitating and accommodating and engaging people I that's my work too is like, okay, we're going to make something together, collaborative work that you're so good at it that you may be supplanting your own internal instinct in exchange for clarity from others. Oh, Ennis. <laughs> oh, you have really uh, given me a lot to think about now here at the end of the hour. <laughs> Ooh, yeah. My <laughs> yeah. And that, you know, you know how you want it to go and that's okay. Mm. And you need to be a leader on it, not a facilitator of it. That's the hardest shift to make. Yes. And it, and it can be disappointing because it's like, Hey gang, let's do this together. And then it's like, okay, great. You do your thing. And ultimately people do want you to do your thing but they, they don't know what that is. Only you know what that is. And so it can feel a little lonely. Mm -hmm. So find peers and other people who may not be the people that you're asking to help you manifest something, but can help you like put that in perspective when it's feeling like, well, I had this idea and these people said they wanted to do it and then they never followed through. It's like, they're not, they may not. Um, and, and that's just part of, the equation. Well, I just can't thank you enough for taking the time uh, to be on this uh, conversation with me today, let alone for all of your years of friendship and mentorship to the field of myself and countless artists and nonprofit organizations across the country and helping us get better at telling our stories and helping us uh, communicate our identities to the world. Um, mm -hmm. I just, I think you're the bee's knees. Um, Thank you. Thank you. Populating, po pollinating all those flowers out there in the world. Do you have a second to stick around after we end the live? I do. Thank you so much for inviting me. It's so special. And I'm just so excited for what's next for you. So it's wonderful to be part of it. Thank you.